you always get the glory. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life. Now, y'all have memorized John 3.16. You need to memorize this here. What is eternal life? And this is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Let's just freeze right there. I need you to understand the profundity of this scripture. Jesus said, y'all think eternal life is dying and going to heaven. That's not what he says. Here's what Jesus says in the red letters for those who are scripturally uninitiated, who have traversed the lands of church services but not decided to do the deep dive into the words of your Savior. Let me give you his words, not my words. We talking God's words, not no hustle. What movie is that from? Malcolm X. Y'all missed it. Anyway, stay with me. Verse 3. You thought it was training day? Girl, he wasn't talking about no Jesus and no training day. That's another Denzel movie. Here's what it says. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. So all these other false gods, false Christs, stop playing with it. I know we're in a different age now where everybody wants to be friends with everybody else. Everybody wants to say that everything's okay, but that's not true. It's going to be people in hell because they believe the wrong thing. Do you hear what I say? He said, you are the only true God. So stop listening to all these, well, there's many ways to get to God. No, he said, I'm the door. I'm the, I'm the way, the truth, and the... No one comes to the Father except through... This is my faith. Why would, I, why would I water that down to please people that can't stand us no way? Would throw you in the garbage the first chance they get. They don't ever compromise on sin. Why are you compromising on the word? This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Help me, Jesus. And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jump down to the 17th verse. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. There's another one, and, and I can tell by the silence that we have not yet gotten the quickening of the Holy Ghost on the power of this scripture. Sanctify us, set us apart by your truth. Your word is truth. So get this thing out of your head where you've been telling people live your truth. That ain't biblical. That's carnal. That's secular humanism. Live your life. Do it your way. Live your truth. Because after all, who can tell you what to do? Well, the manufacturer can tell you what to do. Because he made you. And he made you for his own purpose. And if you get out of his will and out of his warranty, and then you get injured, don't expect for your car parts or the spiritual parts to be fixed because you were outside of warranty. If you do something outside the manufacturer's suggestions, they're not obligated to fix the problem. But thanks be to God that all of us have gotten out of warranty and he still extended his grace. Has anybody ever had an extended warranty called the blood? I dare you to give him a praise for your extended warranty. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The title of my message tonight is The Last Prayer. 
the last prayer. One last prayer. You may be seated. Fifty-five years ago tonight in Memphis, Tennessee, there was a preacher who was a graduate of Morehouse and Boston University and Crozier Theological Seminary. He was 39 years old. He was married. He had four kids. He was just a preacher. He didn't have a Facebook page. He had no Instagram. He wasn't a wealthy man. But he loved God. Is there anybody in here 39? Any, any, anybody 39, 40? Let me see. Just stand up. If you're 39, 40 years old, somewhere. 38, 39, 40. Let me see. 39, 40 years old. Just stay standing. In his 39 short years, he won a Nobel Prize, shifted culture, met with kings, presidents, dignitaries, garbage men. See, because if you can't meet with them, you can't meet with them. Y'all can be seated. He was in town to help some sanitation engineers who were fighting some dishonorable work conditions, including wages and how they were treated. And he began to preach what would be his final sermon. And among the things he said is, I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. And many people would assume that he was speaking about African Americans, but that would be too myopic for a man that large. He was talking about those who have suffered grave injustice. There was a parallel between this man and Moses who saw the promise but never walked in it. Fifty-five years ago, today, double grace, holy week. He preached his last message and then the next day, as he was on the second level of the Lorraine Motel, as he was giving instructions on what song he wanted sung at the service, a sniper's bullet lifted him off of his feet and onto his back while his blood left his body and began to cry out from the ground the same way Abel's blood cried out from the ground for justice. I think about the sacrifice of that moment and how tragic it was. The tragedy of Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination is not lost on me in a country that still has its challenges and issues from political to spiritual to environmental. And here we are as a culture and we are still so hungry for entertainment, so hungry for validation that Instagram made $660 million selling blue check marks so people could feel validated when the blood already did that. If you need a blue check, you have forgotten about the red blood. Now I'm preaching better than a Wednesday night, so I'm gonna expect a Sunday morning shout. You gonna sit up in here, it's Holy Week. He was a good man. He didn't deserve to die like that. But he wasn't a perfect man. Because not one of us is. And how quick do we throw away our heroes when we see their humanity? But there is one you can't throw away. You're going to have to deal with him. Because he lived 33 years, spotless, sinless, holy, 
And if you choose to read John 17 throughout the rest of this week, which I implore you to do, you will find his words where he said, I sanctify myself for the sake of those that you have given me that they may be sanctified in me. What he says is I discipline myself to set myself apart to live a holy life so I can be a living example to the men that you gave me so that when I leave there will be no excuse for them to live an unholy life because they saw the discipline, the passion, and the commitment with which I live my life. You can say a lot of things about him but you can't say he was a sinner you can't say he was for himself you can't say that he was a mean self-serving individual he was loving compassionate kind met with lepers and poor people and broken people and women who had five husbands and was living with a man he would lift up people who were in the middle of adultery caught in the act and still set her free while correcting the people who wanted to kill her he was a bad man he was an unstoppable king they wanted to kill him before the cross and the bible says every time they tried to put their hands on him he would slip through the crowd because you can't touch me until it's time now i feel the holy ghost and i'm gonna need somebody to give god a praise in this place he was and is and is to come Oh, he was a bad man. Even his spit could open your eyes. Oh, I need you to wipe your eyes again and look in the mirror and say, I'm a spitting image. Oh, oh. Now I feel the Holy Ghost in here. Tell somebody I'm a spitting image. He's corrected your vision. You better see yourself the way God sees you. He sees you through the lens of the blood. He sees you through the lens of his son. He sees you through the lens of forgiveness. He sees you through the lens of purpose. I'm the spitting image. And so it's Holy Week. And as I was shedding tears... In my office, I started thinking about Jesus. Jesus. Jesus the Christ. Oh, Lord, help me. Give me the strength to finish this message. Jesus. Ah, the humble servant. Jesus. The carpenter. <laughs> Jesus. Mary's firstborn. Jesus, the first begotten of the dead. Jesus, who is throughout all scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus, the Aleph and the Tav. Jesus, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Before there was a here, he was there. You better preach. I'm preaching. That might be my last, but I'm going to preach it like I feel it. Jesus. We don't say his name enough. The kids know everybody else, every rapper, every sports figure, but they don't know nothing about Jesus. They could do every song from their favorite rapper, and, and they could do it without thinking, but they couldn't even read Psalm 1. Jesus. Uh, we say his name, but we, we mostly have a convenient Jesus. He's a Jesus that is there when we need him, but when he needs us, I'll get back to you, Jesus. I'm in the middle of living my best life, Jesus. I'm living my truth, Jesus. How can you live your truth when I am the truth? And if your truth ain't my truth, then you're living a lie. Oh, God. Jesus. In John chapter 17, we see Jesus praying. It was one last prayer before all heaven broke loose. Now, some of y'all saying, no, it went bad. All hell broke loose. No, 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 no. 
You haven't read Job. <laughs> Devils don't do what they want. <laughs> Satan has to clock in. <laughs> He's an employee. That fool is an employee. He's not an employer. Oh, help me. And he's unemployed. He was the worship leader. We got that job now. I need somebody to help me. He can't even clock in. We got the job. Scoot over. We'll take it from here. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. Honor and power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, he is wonderful. I remember when you and Lily Brown taught the choir that song. It touched me because the altos would come in. All praises be to the King of kings and the Lord. And them sopranos, hallelujah, 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 he is wonderful. would come in hallelujah salvation and glory honor and power he is wonderful altos all Do it again, altos and sopranos. Tenors, where you at?
Get out of that chair. Get off that couch. I dare you to walk around. Somebody tell, say it, he's wonderful. You still in your seat. I need somebody to move around this place. wonderful is there anybody else like me who believes he is wonderful wonderful oh yes he is somebody knows how wonderful he is he looked out for you when you couldn't even look out for yourself his blood was shed before you committed your first sin he's wonderful that's how the prophet described him wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father prince of but the first thing he said was wonderful. I need somebody to let loose in here. Some of y'all still holding on because you don't want anybody to think you crazy. I rep red. My flag is red. I rep red. I rep, I rep the blood of Jesus. That's my click. I rep Christ. Christ alone, cornerstone. Jesus, wonderful Jesus, the carpenter's son. <laughs> he, he said, I, I came to serve, not to be served. I started looking at my life like, man, nobody carried Jesus' Pentateuch for him. Thank you. I'm glad we have a Bible scholar. Basically, the Pentateuch was the Hebrew Bible written by Moses. Now, the king of kings should have a parade of hosts and attendants, but here he was just walking into the temple, sit down, open the book, blow your mind, walk out. He was doing that since he was 12. He was, he was making the rabbis realize how dumb they really were, and he wasn't even trying. He was just asking questions like, now, tell me about this. How do you interpolate that? Help me with that, because here's what I get from it, and I should get it because I wrote it. For those who say, he wrote the Pentateuch, read Hebrews. Behold, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do the, your will, O oh God. Every book points to Jesus. Every book came from Jesus. See? Ah. And here on Thursday night, this scripture was taking place on Thursday. Tomorrow is Maundy Thursday for those who are not particularly vested in the intricacies of each day. We know Good Friday, we know Resurrection Sunday, which many people call Easter, but Easter or Uster, which is the spring solstice, the equinox, the spring solstice is not something that we celebrate. 
It's a pagan holiday. Easter is not in the Bible, but the resurrection is. For those that have been grafted into the promise, we're actually, this is Passover week. The commemoration of the Father freeing the children of Israel after 430 years of slavery. And since Pharaoh wouldn't let them go, he hit them with plague after plague after plague, giving the enemy a chance to say mercy. But since he said, but he won't turn, so I'm going to harden his heart. He said, but I'm going to kill the firstborn of everything they got. Then they're going to let you go. So the Passover is symbolic of the blood being... <laughs> Sprinkled on the doorposts. He said, when I see the blood on the door, ow. Help me. Listen to me. You could you could have been a Jew, but if the blood wasn't on the door, you was gonna die if you were the firstborn. This needs to give you some some freedom in your house because there's some folk in your house that ain't doing right. But because you're there, the blood is on the door. Until they get it right, he going to pass by. You better. Oh, my God. Does anybody hear what I'm saying?